down into single figures in many places to start the weekend. So uh, we start with blue skies and the sunshine will soon start to lift those temperatures. But it will be quite a grey morning for Scotland. Bit of patchy rain for Northern Ireland, and we'll see a few lightish showers spreading across the central belt at times, but staying fairly damp across the far north of Scotland. Temperatures here mid to high teens. If it brightens up in the east later, we might see 20 Celsius, but further south, easily over 20 degrees, 24, 25 across the southeast. So feeling pretty warm by the afternoon after that chilly old start. A bit more cloud spilling into northern England, small chance of a shower here and there on Saturday evening. We will keep further outbreaks of rain going over the highlands, the northern isles and the western isles. But otherwise, most places looking again dry as we head into Sunday. And again, certainly across the south, another day of lengthy spells of sunshine. And after a coolish start, it'll be pretty warm by the afternoon. Always likely to keep some outbreaks of rain going across western Scotland, but a largely dry and bright day across uh, Aberdeenshire down through to the borders and here turning a bit warmer. Uh, further south again, temperatures likely to get into the mid or even high 20s and temperatures set to rise further next week. Join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain every Saturday and Sunday from 2pm. A news hour that comes with a trigger warning. Scorching hot opinion with prominent guests saying the unsayable and a little bit of weekend fun thrown in. Unlike other broadcasters, I won't be forgetting what the B in our name stands for. So how are you in for Real Britain Saturday and Sunday from 2pm? We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7 p.m. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9 p.m. on GB News. Be there. Hello there, it's six o'clock. I'm Michelle Jubry. This is Jubes and Co. And guess what? It is Friday. How did that happen? It feels like one second it is Monday. The next, here we are on a Friday without a minute to blink in between. Uh, nonetheless, the week has flown by. Here we are again. And you know what we do on a Friday, don't you? Uh, we get into the issues that matter, the issues that really are affecting people up and down the land. Uh, we've done immigration so far. We looked at the cost of living last week as well, this week. Uh, we want to get into housing, let's face it. I mean, the, the situation in the UK when it comes to getting onto the housing ladder uh, is a mess, isn't it? Have you been lucky enough to do so? Are you one of the even luckier ones that are sitting, relaxing on a cushion of equity, wondering what on earth will you spend all your riches on? Or are you someone that actually work as hard as you can 
you feel that you simply cannot get onto the housing ladder no matter what you do. Are you lucky? Do you have parents that could help you with a deposit? Or is that absolutely not the case for you? Is the government building enough houses? Should they be building more? Many people say the population is rising up and up and up, but yet the houses are not being built at a fast enough rate. So what is going on and what are the answers to it? We'll be getting into all of that tonight. So I wanna hear your stories when it comes to housing. What is your situation? But first, let's bring ourselves up to speed with tonight's latest news headlines brought to you this evening by Tatiana Sanchez. It's one minute past six. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB newsroom. Rishi Sunak has defended comments he made during a campaign event saying as Chancellor he diverted government funding from deprived urban areas towards more affluent towns. Video obtained by the New Statesman shows the leadership hopeful speaking to grassroots conservatives in Tunbridge Wells and Kent last week. Man is to start changing the funding formulas to make sure that areas like this are getting the funding that they deserve because we inherited a bunch of formulas from the Labour Party that shoved all the funding into deprived urban areas then uh, they you know that needed to be undone I started the work of undoing that well the Tory leadership hopeful says he altered the formula to help both towns and rural areas well I was making the point that deprivation exists right across our country and needs to be addressed and that's why we need to make sure our funding formulas recognize that and people who need help and extra investment aren't just limited to big urban areas. You find them in towns across the United Kingdom and in rural areas too. And that was a point I was making, that our funding formulas that fail to recognise that are out of date and they need a changing. The two candidates vying for Tory party leader will appear on stage in Eastbourne this evening. They've already clashed over the UK's economy. That's after the Bank of England warned the country will face its longest recession since the financial crisis. Mr Sunak claims his rival's economic plans would damage the country. But Liz Truss believes measures can be taken to avoid recession. The reality is we are facing a recession if we carry on with our business as usual policies. We need to do more and that's why I'm determined to reform the economy and keep taxes low. If there is a recession... That will mean people losing jobs. That will mean more economic hardship. So that is why it's so important that we do all we can to grow the economy. Police have shot a man following an incident in southeast London. The officers were responding to reports of a person carrying a gun in Greenwich. He was treated at the scene before being airlifted to hospital. Police say there doesn't appear to be an ongoing threat to the public. The Unite Union has announced nearly 2,000 workers at the Port of Felixstowe will strike for eight days later this month in a dispute over pay. Union members will walk out from the 21st of August after they failed to reach a deal with the Felixstowe Dock and Railway Company. It's the biggest and busiest container port in Britain and is thought to handle nearly half of all container trade in the UK. Network Rail has voted to accept a pay offer after several strikes in disputes over pay and conditions. The Transport Salaried Staffs Association says its managers have accepted the offer, which includes a 4% increase on base pay from the 1st of July and discounted travel for employees. But the union has said it will stay in talks with Network Rail to continue delivering a fair deal for its members going forwards. China's foreign ministry has announced the country is severing a number of diplomatic ties with the United States, including top-level military following a visit by U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan. Well, today, the nation has sent 49 jets across the Taiwan Strait median line in a show of strength. The country has also sanctioned Ms Pelosi and her immediate family, accusing her of interfering in China's internal affairs and threatening the peace and stability of Taiwan. Beijing has launched a number of missiles into waters near Taiwan in response to the visit, saying the US is playing with fire. US media reports the White House has summoned the Chinese ambassador to condemn the escalating actions. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the differences between the US and China need to be resolved peacefully. 
a hose pipe ban for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight has come into force today. Southern Water says the country is experiencing one of the driest years on record. River flows are about 25% lower than they should be at this time of year. So it's asking customers to limit their water usage until further notice. The measure will follow next week for South East Water customers in Kent and Sussex. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Jubes & Co. Thanks for that, Tatiana. Well, keeping me company until 7 o'clock tonight, my panel, Denisha Kazi, who's a senior economist at Positive Money, and the former Lib Dem advisor, Rabina Khan, who's also uh, used to sit, didn't you, on the housing committee at Tower Hamlets here in London. Good evening to both of you. Uh, Denisha, your first time on GB News. <laughs> welcome. We do love a new face here on Jubes & Co, so you're very welcome indeed. Uh, and you know the drill on Jubes & Co as well, don't you? It's not just about us here. Uh, it's about you at home as well. What's on your mind tonight when I talk to you about housing? Is it a subject that you think, oh, what is everyone complaining about? There's nothing wrong with a housing situation in this country, you say as you recline on your sofa in your living room of your house that you bought about 30 years ago for about, I don't know, 20 grand and is now worth over a million pound. Are you in that camp or are you someone, I don't know, you're watching this in the living room of your parents, uh, sorry, on the TV in your parents' living room, sitting there, desperate to move out from your parents' house, no offence, parents, uh, but you feel like you don't have a chance uh, at all to do so because you are priced out of the market as well. Are you a landlord? Are you someone that's got multiple properties? And you are, what some people say, the problem in this society. You and your greedy, grubby, profiteering. That's what some people say. How would you respond to that? You can get in touch with me on email, gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can tweet me at gbnews or at Michelle Jubes. One of my viewers, Steve, uh, you are the first email in today. Bang on, six o'clock, Steve, uh, was your first email. You say, Michelle, the housing crisis is caused by second homes and holiday lets. This basically means that too many houses are unoccupied for most of the year. Uh, he's got a plan, as our Steve. He says, you can resolve this with two new taxes. So what do you reckon to this, everybody? This is Steve, the viewer's idea. Number one, uh, charge an empty night tax. Make second home and Airbnb owners pay £50 for every night their property is empty. And number two, capital gains tax. Steve's not messing around. He says you should have a 100% tax applied to wipe out any house price gain when it's a second home or holiday let that is sold. Oh, crikey, Steve, you're quite harsh. Uh, or is he sensible? Is Steve's plan the right plan? Uh, of course, this comes on a backdrop, doesn't it? So, um, the, this topic of housing. Yesterday, the Bank of England raised interest rates again. Let's face it, we knew they were going to do that. And they will be doing it a little bit more, I suspect, in the near future. Uh, but this time, they raised it to rates in their highest level for 14 years. But is this really going to make a difference, do you think? Is it going to pause uh, the, the rush that some people have uh, to get into the housing ladder? Or is it going to make it even worse? There's so many people there sitting, right, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. So you're just pushing up demand more and more and more. Rents, of course, are increasing, it seems, all the time. So shall we just take a second just to recap where we are and how we've got here? <laughs> Fifty years ago, a third of homes in the UK were affordable, with social housing provided by local authorities. Then came along Margaret Thatcher and the Housing Act of 1980. The right to buy market with huge discounts for council house tenants wanting to own their own homes became turbocharged. Over the years, the money councils were allowed to keep to build new homes was reduced, and so the number of replacement properties fell. But it wasn't all selling off council houses. Deregulation in the city in the 80s made mortgages more available. Would-be homeowners didn't have to prove they could save before they could borrow. The 1988 Housing Act gave housing associations new powers that councils didn't have. Nearly 10 years later, and over a quarter of a million council houses had been transferred into housing association ownership. 
The housing crash at the start of the 1990s pushed many homeowners into negative equity, but by the mid-90s, house prices were on the up again, driven by a supply problem. As the population grew, the UK just wasn't building enough homes. Average mortgage payments went from being a fifth of income to around a third. The growth in the buy-to-let market also drove house prices up and put more properties onto the rental market. At the start of the millennium, the number of new council houses built in the UK was just 50. The 2007 global credit crunch caused housing hardship for some. But for others, the fall in house prices was an opportunity. More people invested in property, bloating the rental sector. As the 2000s went on, government policies such as help to buy and increasing the cap on what councils can spend on building homes have done little to improve the supply of good affordable homes. At the time of the Queen's Silver Jubilee in 1977, councils provided 32% of homes in the UK. At the time of this year's Platinum Jubilee, that number is approximately just 8%. Fascinating stuff. Tanisha, where do you stand uh, in terms of, you know, the situation with housing? What do you think has got us to this point today? Yeah, um, I think, um, you know, the dominant narrative around housing and the housing crisis has often been that it's a supply issue. We don't build enough homes. And I think certainly that's true in some respects in areas that there's high demand and a lot of pressures. And especially with regards to social housing and affordable housing, we definitely do not build enough. And we've decimated the social housing sector. And those two things are quite different, aren't they? Social housing and affordable Absolutely. housing. They get used interchangeably. Just yeah. briefly explain the difference between the two. Yeah, social housing is um, subsidised, obviously. It's um, housing for people on the lowest kind of end of the income distribution. It's um, provided by the council and our local authorities. Affordable housing can still be provided by private developers, for example but it's um, a little bit more affordable. And um, I think, you know, it's questionable about whether it is affordable because mm. it's still at market rates. It's not linked to, say, for example, people's incomes. And a striking feature of the housing crisis is the, the gap between house prices and um, people's incomes has grown sort of astronomically. So right now, the uh, sort of ratio of house average house prices to average incomes has hit almost nine, um, nine times and in London, it's 13 times. So mm. you need 13 times your income to afford a house in London and nine times in, in the rest of the country. And the average used to be about four or five times your income up until um, very recently. So we've had a kind of distortion of the market that needs to be corrected, I guess. Indeed. Uh, Rubina, where do you stand? I think um, when I look at this, um, and I, I thought the film clip was really good. It was very comprehensive. I would just go back a little bit further to post-World War II when Winston Churchill, through the Burke Committee, introduced the first housing programme in which to rebuild Britain. And so between 1945 and 1951, under Churchill and under Attlee, they built 1.2 million homes. And subsequently after that, decades of consecutive governments um, have failed to build um, the homes that we need in this country. Um, and I think that's um, a responsibility across both the mainstream um, political parties who have been in power, that their failure, and there was this sense of complacency that we've built previously and we will continue. And we can only just see that 32% was built in um, 1977, only 8% this year. What I do want to just comment on is about the right to buy. Now, the right to buy has been has been criticised from, you know, a range of people, but actually the right to buy enabled people to get onto the housing ownership, leasehold, um, flat ownership system. But what it failed to do was to reinvest mm. and to build more homes. And again, it goes back to the, the point that Denisha has brought in about um, supply and demand. Um, and now we are in a housing crisis where we have problems with the leasehold, shared ownership. We have problems um, in the rental sector, private PRS, private rental sector. We're failing to build social housing. We have also um, not provided the funds for councils to build their own homes. But instead, um, through the under a Labour administration, they had the stock transfer, which meant that we built housing associations who have more and more power. 
Um, and I welcome um, a few things in the past about the housing um, going forward in terms of holding housing associations to account. So in a gist, the crisis, housing crisis, is a range of issues that are affecting people in this country, not just about home ownership. Indeed, and one of the um, uh, comments that's coming through, I have to say, I can see it coming in on the inbox as well, is this whole kind of conversation about second homes. Some people are saying that this is one of the big reasons why many people can't afford to have a first home, because so many people have got a second home. Um, in Cornwall, for example, uh, up to 40% of properties in some places are used as second homes. Uh, Kath Navin joins me now. She's uh, over in Cornwall, and she is the co-founder of First, Not Second Homes. Um, Hi, good evening to you. Kath, let me ask you, um, I, I mean, you know, you do what you say on the tin. You know, if you're the founder of First Not Second Homes, I'm guessing that you're not a huge fan of second homes. But if someone's worked hard, got a bit of spare cash, why shouldn't they be able to have a little holiday home by the sea? I think um, in previous years, this has been... Um, perfectly acceptable but when you've got a situation that we've got at the moment in Cornwall where we have over 22,000 households that are in emergency accommodation we've got real issues with second home ownership so it's it's about how those second homes are used having a second property in and of itself isn't the main issue it's how those properties are used and they're being flipped from long-term let to short-term letting without any particular legislative um, of changes and we've got an issue where people are just being literally being turfed out because you can maximize your profit on your second home ownership if you use it as a short-term let you can get upwards of five times more than you can for a long-term let currently so you know why wouldn't people ch use that advantage to make as much money as possible but it's not what, it, what it's doing is it's killing communities and people are just being kicked out of their home for no good reason. And these are hardworking people, the same as those people that have worked hard to get a second home. So, Kath, um, help me understand. I mean, I've been to Cornwall a few times, lovely part uh, of the country. But often yeah. uh, we see Cornwall, the, you know, your local kind of industries, economies, etc. they're thriving because of people like tourists. So what you're describing here is you've got now a plethora of property uh, that's been used on short-term lets. I imagine it'll be things like Airbnb, so a family in one week, a family in the next, etc., etc. Surely that's good for your local economy. Um, yeah, in to a degree. So we've only got 12% of our economy currently is dependent on tourism. So if you consider that 12% um, and how much of the year that, that that's actually putting in the local economy, with an Airbnb, for instance, that those individuals will be coming down. Yeah, they might eat out, but they've chosen to go into an Airbnb because it's self-catering. So the self-catering money would go to Morrison's or Sainsbury's, other you know, stores are available. Um, but you would, those people aren't contributing 100% to the local economy for 100% of the year. So it's only during the holiday period. If those homes were owned and lived in for 365 days of the year, those families would be contributing to the economy 365 days of the year. And it just it evens things out in terms of the other industry that we've got down here. Agriculture is actually our main industry. And Visit Cornwall did some assessment uh, towards the end of last year. And even by 2060, they believe that only one in four jobs maximum will be attributed to tourism. So it's not actually, we do, we're not as dependent on it as it might seem. So just briefly, uh, final question to you, I guess. What should happen yep. then? You've got all these second homes. What do you want to happen? Should people be forced to sell them or what? Well, again, it's about how they're used. So if they're young, underused, if they're underoccupied, then we need to legislate to make sure that they're used for their primary purpose, which is housing stock. We're not saying no holiday lets. What we're saying is there should be a balance. Currently, we've got a situation where um, in in the north of the county, I'm not going to say where exactly, but um, because it wouldn't be fair, but I was sent a letter that's been uh, sent out to a local primary school because they're losing a class teacher. And it said exclusively within that letter, 
we are losing a classroom teacher and, and classes are being joined because of the lack of affordable houses for young families. So if we had legislation, for instance, similar to the, what's been introduced in St Ives, where new builds are restricted to first home occupancy, that would help. But that's got to be in conjunction with things like planning um, restrictions that stop people flipping from long-term let to short-term let with things like getting rid of Section 21, which has been talked about since Theresa May was in power. Um, and also, let's not forget the landlords. We want to protect landlords. So we have a good landlord scheme, have support for them if they've got bad tenants give incentives to landlords to make long-term letting more attractive so people move back to that. Because um, anecdotally, currently this year, last year it was 100% bookings in Cornwall. This year um, it's been reported that only 60% of the holiday lets are actually being booked up. So we've seen that boom and now we're coming back from that. But it's about supporting landlords to make that transition back into something so they feel safe and secure. And that will give security to those individuals that um, want to live in rented accommodation because it's not we're not okay. saying you have to sell your home. Okay, fascinating stuff. Kath uh, Navin there, so, as I mentioned, she is the co-founder of First, not Second Homes. Thanks for your time. Um, Denisha, what did you think to what you just heard then? Yeah, it's a really interesting um, um, conversation that needs to be had around Second Homes. It's also multi people have multiple homes mm -hmm. and um, we also have a burgeoning private rental sector, which has doubled in size since the 2000s. And Home, home, ownership rate, um, home ownership rates are falling. So um, there are a lot of people who can't buy and they're going to be dependent on the private rental sector for mo almost all of their lives, really. They're, you know, generation rent is growing up, they say, is becoming, they're becoming older into the midlife, they're becoming you know, families, they have children in the private rental sector. So I just wanted to take a step back to kind of look at what are the sort of drivers behind what was just said about the second homes. And the um, the issue really is around the demand side of the equation in, um, in the story, which we often neglect, which is, you know, housing plays a dual role. It's shelter, but it's also an asset that people want to use to accumulate wealth. Certainly is. And, yeah. and yeah, and I think that's what's become out of control. It's become far more of a financial asset than a, in a, a basic need, basically. Rubina? Thanks, I mean, we've had this kind of conversation when Whitby brought their referendum about mm. second homes as well. And what it shows here is about communities. And Kath eloquently summed it all up about the fact that communities feel that they've been left behind. That's not what we want in these communities. We want to make sure that a home is not... I mean, it's this narrative that if you have a house, house... Um, in this day and age, we're looking at someone's wealth and income is actually stipulated to whether or not they own a home and a, a house. But what we have to change the narrative, instead of saying house building, we should be calling it home building. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that narrative has to change that. It's not just about a house for you, it's an object. It's an actual home. And within a home, you then start building communities, sustainable communities around you. And what Kath said was really interesting about the fact that it's only 12% of the tourism industry, that there are other economies, agriculture. And so in terms of retaining the tourism there and allowing people um, whether or not they've got they've got businesses there is a second home levy. Well, let me know your thoughts. Where do you stand on this? Uh, is this just as simple as, uh, you know, um, second homes or what? I mean, some people here are saying there isn't even a housing crisis, Michelle. It's a population growth um, crisis, an immigration crisis. That's what you guys are saying is one of the things that we're not focusing on, that we should be. Charlie um, says, I'm unfortunate enough to live in an area where all the houses are being bought up um, at £30,000 above the market price by Switzerland. Uh, city dwellers, he says, this needs to be stopped. That area is Scarborough. I love uh, Scarborough, very nice um, holiday area there. Charlie, what I would say to you, a lot of people are getting upset about uh, house prices, etc. You know, what about the people that are selling these properties? Because it's all well and good, the demand being there, pay this extra 30 grand. If people are so concerned about their local communities, etc., why don't they sit there and say, no, thanks, I don't want your extra 30 grand. I'm going to take it at 30 grand less and give it to, I don't know, that guy down the road, my local community member. Uh, are the house sellers just as bad 
as the city buyers that you mentioned there. You tell me at gbviews at gbnews.uk what, who is to blame when it comes to the housing situation we find ourselves in. I'll see you in a second. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. As the race for number 10 intensifies, we are giving you the chance to get to know our next Prime Minister. We've invited the two candidates to meet you, the GB News viewers, and let you put your questions to them. Head directly to gbnews.uk or send me your questions to questions at gbnews.uk. Join Alistair Stewart for the People's Forum with Liz Truss. Wednesday at 5, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Hello there, welcome back to Jews & Co with me, Michelle Jubery. We're doing our special Friday Focus today uh, and under the spotlight is housing. What is going on with the situation in this country when it comes to the housing market? Uh, to some people, it's not a problem at all. It's excellent, in fact. They bought their property years ago. They sit on a healthy little cushy amount of equity, so they do. That's excellent, isn't it? Uh, but what about for everyone else? Have you tried getting on the housing ladder recently? Uh, have you got kids that are trying to get on the housing ladder? How is it for them? Uh, keeping me company to get into some of these issues tonight, my panel, Denisha Kazi, who's a senior economist at Positive Money, and Rubina Khan, a former member of the Housing Committee on Tower Hamlets Council. Good evening again to both of you. Now, I have to say, for many people, buying uh, a property is just simply not an option. Instead, they are pushed into the rental sector, not necessarily by choice. Figures released this week show the cost of renting has risen to record levels in 40 cities across the UK. On average, people now spend about 30% of their income on rent. Although I've got to say, in places like London, for example, it can be much, much higher. Uh, when you think about the rental sector, by the way, you've got private landlords, housing associations and council-run accommodation. So it's not just kind of one size fits all. And it's not always a bad thing, by the way. Some people do choose uh, to rent. They want to be uh, in rented accommodation, whether it's for flexibility reasons or other. Uh, anyway, Matt Hutchinson is from spareroom.co.uk. He joins me now. Matt, good evening to you. Hello. Uh, how would you regard the rental uh, situation at the moment? Is it out of control or is it accessible in your mind? 
No, I think there's, there, there is a housing crisis across all 10 years. Um, and I think it is a very complex situation that isn't just about home ownership. And the, but the bottom line is we should have all sorts of 10 years rental um, ownership, whatever suits people. But they should all be affordable and accessible to people when they need them. Because exactly as you say, renting is a great option for some people if they need to make sure to turn plans or they want to be able to move around. But we need all of those options to be affordable and currently they're not. Can I just ask, what do you mean by affordable? Because this kind of term, affordable housing, it's written everywhere and everyone talks about it, you're talking about it yourself. What does it actually mean? <laughs> So I think the point Denisha made earlier was, was really important when it came to multiples of people's income. And it's not necessarily just that things are more expensive. It's the ratio of income to expense on housing. Housing is by far everybody's biggest expense. Um, and the amount that it costs compared to how much people earn has changed drastically. So that 30% figure you just quoted, in some areas, that's, you know, there's a lot of the country where people are paying more like 40, 50% of their income on renting. And it just means there's not much left. And it's, it's, it's really important that people are able to house themselves in a way that they are able to also live as well. And it's we, we talk about housing and it makes it sound like a like it's people storage rather than people's homes. And this the point Rabina made about houses versus homes, it's really important because home is such a, a fundamental bit of our lives. And unless everybody can have an affordable, secure, safe home, it doesn't benefit us as a society at all, I don't think. No, I think you make some good points there, Matt. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And also, by the way, thank you, because many years ago, when I first arrived in London for work, I certainly could not afford uh, to rent anywhere to live. So I actually used your website many, many, many years ago uh, to get a, a room in a flat. That was the only way I could afford to be here. So thank you very much. Good service you provide there. That's Matt uh, Hutchinson from spareroom.com. Co.uk, Rabina. Uh, one of the points that he was making there is exactly the point that you was uh, saying about a home is not just a house, an asset. It is, sorry, a house is not just an asset. It is a home. But I, what is the answer to some of this? Because it is just unaffordable. I mentioned that website there. I use that because the only way I could afford when I had to come to work in London was to get a room with a load of randoms in a house. And I mean, it worked out well for me, but people should just be able to afford a flat if that's what they need. But they can't. Well, Michelle, I've got two adult daughters at home and they're not going to be moving out and simply because I don't want them to move out because most of their income will go on the rent in London. Um, a one bedroom flat in London costs between £1,600 a month up to possibly £1,800 a month. And that will take most of the income from a young person trying to stabilise themselves, save money and try to get onto the housing ladder. So when we're looking at this, the government's renters reform bill, which is um, out now, that needs to be... I mean, they, they put some really good points in there about the fact that it's got to be the decent standards, the um, um, Section 21 being taken out, and also um, the aspects that there would be a housing ombudsman panel as well. But we have to do far more than that in the rental sector. We've got to start stabilising those rents in order to make sure that a generation of young people who need to get into the private rented sector in order to obtain housing, we need to stabilise that market. And at the moment, consecutive governments, and I've said it, before they've all been responsible for letting the rental sector get out of control and we have to now stabilize it at a moment at a critical moment just as and I referred back to my original when I comments about World War II we need in this country just as World War II post World War II there was this hunger to rebuild this country to ensure things that were stabilized to build and rebuild in a way that we can both stabilise an economy, but also empower the next generation of young people. And Denisha, how do we control this rental uh, market then? What do sure, we do? Yeah. I think something that we, um, you know, the white paper has some, made some good moves, but needs to go further. Um, and one really important policy that we could start looking at again is rent controls, yeah. which Rabina has obviously um, referred to. Um, and the thing about rent controls is it's not radical at all. We had them in the UK for most of the 20th century, up, up until very recently. Most of Europe has rent controls of some form and even parts of America. And that would really help bring um, prices back under control. So what does that mean? So as a, let's just say I've got a two-bed flat in, yeah. I don't know, Hull. Um, what, the government's going to tell me, Michelle, you can't increase your rent any more than X? It would be localised, I think. So it should be according to the local housing market. And it would be to say you can either limit rate increases or in limit the initial um, level of rent. And you can use a combination of them. And, you know, these sort of things have to be 
um, developed sort of over time and slowly so that we don't hurt all the different sectors of the economy. So, you know, we don't want to, the private rental sector supply to just suddenly reduce or something like that. So we do need to manage them, but rent controls could be a really great way to protect people. Um, and again, they have it in Europe um, used quite widely to protect renters. Rental controls there. Uh, Leslie has been in touch, a private landlord, she says, we're now selling up all of our private rented portfolio of 15 houses. We are fed up with how we as landlords have been treated by the government, the taxman, the authorities, etc. She says, um, well, I assume you're a she actually, Leslie, I don't know. Leslie says uh, it's no longer a feasible business being a landlord. Uh, the housing sector is totally upside down and needs a serious rethink, says Leslie, the landlord that's literally uh, about to sell off their portfolio. Uh, joining me now is Spencer Wood, who's the managing director of Ultralets in Hull, letting agency Spencer. Uh, landlords, they're getting a bad name, I can tell you. Many people are emailing in to me today are saying it's greedy landlords buying up properties, inflating the rents. It's their fault. What do you say back to that? Well, I think there's a misconception, Michelle, that all landlords are in their big offices and renting their properties to, to poor people. That's that's certainly not the case. Uh, we work with hundreds of landlords that are based all around the UK and invest in the whole on a regular basis. Um, you know, they're... they're um, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I get what you mean. What you're trying to say, Spencer, I think, is that they're not mini Alan Sugars. They're often your average man on the streets, these landlords. Quite often, the average man on the street maybe got two or three properties. Um, if you look deep dive into the numbers, Michelle, the uh, landlords on average home let released a, an article recently where they said that landlords only actually make seven percent profit on their on their property investments when you factor in the mortgage interest, you factor in the uh, management fees they pay to their letting agent, you factor in the tax they're paying, uh, repairs on the property, some allocation for void periods, and in our area in East Yorkshire, the rents have only gone up by eight percent in the last year. So. Landlords aren't actually making huge amounts of money. And what do you say, because another thing that's been discussed on this panel and again is coming through on my uh, inbox is Section 21. People are saying get rid of it. Uh, it means that landlords can kick people out the house. Denisha's uh, nodding away. Where do you stand on that? Uh, I don't think we've got a lot of choice, to be honest. I think it's going to happen anyway. Um, I don't think it's a good idea for the industry. I think it'll put a lot of people off investing and a lot of people will sell up. We're already seeing probably 20% of landlords are reporting are uh, considering selling their investment properties. Um, but as long as they make the Section 8 a little bit looser and easier to enforce so that we can you know, get bad tenants out more easily, I think that it'd be, it'd be workable. And my last question to you, uh, Spencer, before I let you go is, uh, Denisha, one of my panellists here, was just advocating for rent control. Is that the answer? Uh, possibly in some of the larger cities like London, Manchester, Leeds, where, you know, there are, you know, rents are being hiked up at considerable rates. But um, I, I would say that, you know, landlords, their costs go up. That can't be limited. Um, so why should the rental incomes that they can charge be limited as well? We, we know from what you said that the profit's not as good as, as people think. Indeed. Interesting point. Spencer Wood, the uh, Managing Director of Ultralets in Hull. Uh, thanks for your time. So just to mention, I mean, the figure there that Spencer was talking about is for every pound of rent that's paid into a landlord, this is how it kind of tends to break down. So mortgage interest uh, is 67p, tax 3p, repairs 5p, management fees 11p, the void period that Spencer was referring to 4p, insurance is 3p, giving the landlord a net profit of seven pence in a pound. That example, by the way, is on an average house price of 290 grand with a 75% buy-to-let mortgage at 4%. I've got to say, 7p in the pounds, why bother? And I do wonder if you're going to see an influx of landlords giving up, selling up their property, uh, putting them back onto the market, would that be a good thing? Um, potentially, yes, because, um, you know, a system where you have lots of small landlords means they don't have the capital to invest in good housing conditions for repairs and things like that. So, you know, as you say, they're almost breaking even, maybe. So it's not really a good business model for someone to earn income from. Um, one thing we could have is as supply, um, as landlords leave the sector, um, housing and land could go towards community trusts and community ownership. 
um, and that's a, a really good model for us to, to sort of start scaling up. It's a non-market form of housing to support people on lower incomes. So communities themselves would own the land and own the properties and they would probably be able to link them to wage growth, for example, and so therefore they'll be affordable rather than linking them to market rates. So um, there are options that we can sort of transfer the, those sort of landlords over to um, community trusts as well. And, um, and, and yes, I think it's time that, you know, we started making homes somewhere that's safe, secure, that everyone can afford and that have good conditions rather than it being a business model for people to earn income from. Yeah, um, I'm just having a look at some of your comments here. Ellie says, Michelle, I live in uh, Hinkley on a new builds estate and we found out recently that a block of six two-bedroom starter homes had been bought by a local investor, which he now rents out. There was absolutely no chance of a young family being able to buy one. Surely this is wrong. Help me understand something. This is kind of your bag, uh, Rabina. In terms of when a property uh, developer is by, uh, building a complex of however many houses, whatever, mm. are there any restrictions in there that say to the developer, you know, you, ca you have to retain X for direct ownership, you can't sell to investors or landlords, or can a developer sell pretty much the whole thing to uh, investors if he or she chooses? Well, it, for any development, if it's a large development, a certain number of homes has to be given to the local authority for social housing and the council will take responsibility through their housing and waiting register policies to ensure people are allocated homes according to their needs, according to different factors. And in terms of sale, that's an open market. Um, and there have been things where it's shared ownership, you can buy things off the plan. And I think it's now more and more important to think about how, whether or not we have a certain, um, for example, if it's social housing, they have a local lettings plan. Is it time now to have a, a local sales plan in place so that we can enable people to get onto the housing register, um, to get onto the housing ladder, to, so that they have first priority to be able to see whether or not they can purchase that first flat. So just as social housing may have a local lettings plan, why not enable in any given development where flats are being put up for sale, that there is a local sales plan to enable people to purchase a property. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way we need to look at it. We also need to look at the way we develop further. So for example, Network Rail Land, has huge amounts of land. It's a national asset under the government and it's got about 120,000 acres of land. It has two and a half thousand stations and yet we're not using that kind of land to build. Net I've always advocated to build network rail, little small pockets of villages to enable to have both the private rented sector, social housing and um, people who want to own their own homes as well. And so if we look towards ensuring that we have creative ways of building homes, why not? Why isn't this government doing this? Mm, indeed, why not? That is the million dollar question, isn't it? Carol's been in uh, touch saying rent control would be brilliant. Homes are rented at extortionate rates and in a bad state of repair. They are preying on the desperate, these landlords, who would rather be uh, in these houses than on the street. Uh, she says, I think uh, rent should be capped. What would you say then to Spencer, uh, Carol, the boss then of the lettings agency I just spoke to, um, what he just rightly pointed out is, hang on a second, his costs are not capped so as a landlord. You've still got all your repairs. You've still got uh, ever-increasing uh, interest rates. You've got tax changes, which means now you can't offset things like your mortgage interest in the way that you once could. Uh, so how do you balance that then? Surely, if you're going to cap the income on one side, it's only fair, isn't it, or is it, to cap the expenditure on the other? You tell me. Um, Andrew has said, you have a complete anti-landlord bias. Um, from your guest tonight, most landlords are providing a good service and they do invest in maintenance, says Andrew. Andrew, I completely agree with you and I actually think that a lot of landlords uh, provide a vital service because as Bernard, one of my other viewer, points out, uh, he says, Landlords selling properties won't help the situation because many of the people renting are renting because they can't afford to buy. And I think that, Bernard, you make uh, an interesting point. It feeds into Andrew's point there um, in terms of landlords. Many of them are good, decent people. Mm. Uh, and by the way, 
there's some right wrong ones when it comes to tenants as well. So don't be fooled. Don't be sitting there thinking, oh, the baddies in this scenario are the landlords and the goodies are the tenants because I can assure you uh, it can work both ways. Right, I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, when I um, come back in a couple of minutes, I'm going to talk to you about what's the solution. But before I leave you, uh, I'll tell you a little fun fact I learned today. I was thinking about Monopoly. And I was thinking to myself, gosh, this whole notion of property being an asset has been on and on for years and years and years. 1903, Monopoly was invented. Uh, and then I found out an interesting fact, actually. Monopoly wasn't invested as a, oh, let's all be capitalists and profiteer on uh, property. It was quite the opposite. It was um, invented by a woman who was quite a, a, a left-leaning feminist. And this is what she invented it for. For it to be, I quote, a practical demonstration of the present system of land grabbing with all of its usual outcomes and consequences. So there you go, a little interesting fun fact. Monopoly was actually um, intended to show you the downside of capitalism when it comes to property ownership. Right, uh, let me know your thoughts on the solutions to all of this and I'll see you in a couple of minutes. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7 p.m. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9 p.m. on GB News. Be there. The man who wants to be the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, sits down with me, Esther McVeigh and Philip Davis this Saturday. Don't miss it. Does the former Chancellor have what it takes to beat his rival, Liz Truss? Can he regain the momentum he's lost over the last couple of weeks? All questions and all answers put to the Tory leadership hopeful, Rishi Sunak, tomorrow, 10am on GB News, The People's Channel. Hello there, welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubery. Special Friday focus on tonight's programme, looking at housing. Uh, what a pickle we've got ourselves into in this country when it comes to housing. It's all right, uh, isn't it, if you're someone that's got a house, made a fortune on it, good for you. But for the rest of us, it's uh, quite a challenge. That is certainly the message that I'm receiving from a lot of you guys as well at home. Uh, keeping me company until 7 o'clock tonight, we've got my panel, Denisha Kazi, who's a senior economist at Positive Money and Rabina Khan, who's the former member of the Housing Committee at Tower Hamlets Council. 
Uh, we've been, if you just joined us, by the way, we've been speaking a lot about some of the situations, some of the causes of this, uh, some of the potential solutions. So people have been talking about things like second uh, homes. Is it their fault that we find ourselves where we are now? Is it greedy landlords, uh, as some people have been suggesting? Uh, although I think I've been trying to put the case that there's a lot of decent landlords out there as well. What are the answers to some of these things? What about rent controls? Um, those kind of things. Now, uh, Denise, I'll start with you. What are your thoughts then? So let's kind of bring this to some form of uh, conclusion. What are we going to do? So if you was uh, advising uh, whoever the next prime minister is going to be on September the 5th, and you've got to say to them, do three things to fix the housing situation, what would it be? Yep, um, I would start with, um, we basically need a long-term housing strategy to make housing more affordable over time. So those, those sort of um, ratios of house prices to incomes needs to come down from nine to four, basically. Um, I would say the Bank of England could target house price inflation, not with interest rates, but with other policies, how they, they can restrict lending to certain, um, to certain buy-to-let landlords or to certain sectors, and direct lending to first-time buyers, for example. That would help first-time buyers onto the ladder. Um, we need to reform the tax system so it's much fairer. So we're taxing unearned gains from property at the same rate as taxing income. And the Office for Tax Simplification has said that that this should happen as well. And finally, we need to make the private rental sector just much more secure, mm. safe and affordable for people. And part of that we discussed was rent controls, but we can also have non-market forms of housing, such as community housing. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, Rubina, your thoughts? My thoughts, uh, because um, as I said right from the beginning, housing is so complex and we have to think about products. What products can meet the needs of people in this um, country, from whether they're renters to social housing, to council housing, to people who want to own their own homes, to shared ownership, to people who want to learn, um, live in community land trust. So the, one of the big things that I would want to do straight away is to get rid of leasehold and introduce common hold, so whereby you give autonomy to flat owners and shared ownerships, um, and to also make sure that leaseholders affected by high service charges, this is is looked into and that they have a fairer system and also leaseholders affected by the cladding safety um, bills that they're facing that they do not need to pay any of that um, safety cost so that's leasehold in terms of social housing social housing and council homes fall into one portfolio council homes need to council um, local authorities need to be given the funding to build more and more council homes and social housing in terms of housing association who build and regulate and look after tenants, well they need to be held far more accountable to what they're doing because there are about 15,000 housing associations following the stock transfer. There are many, I'm sure you've read, who have been in the papers for the wrong reasons. If they get it wrong, then their homes should be given back to the councils in that area to be looked after and to maintain. And I think that would be a really good way of sending messages to housing associations. And the third, which I believe, and I've said before, is about how do we increase supply in such a way that we can enable people to both access the private rented sector um, and stabilise that private rented sector to also enable people to purchase their own homes. And I've said one, which is the network rail land, to build a network rail um, housing corporation. To, um, it's a national asset. They're already in debt of 54.1 billion um, pounds. They have enormous acres of land. They are not a um, residential building um, entity. They look after our network uh, and the railways. What they need to do is we need to take that land under the government and to ensure that we ha invest in that land for the people of this country. There you go. Well, that's the panel's views. You guys are sending me in your solutions. Uh, some quite radical solutions coming in, I've got to say. What did you think? Do you remember, I think it was Stephen at the start of the show, what did you think to his ideas? He was basically saying, apply 100% tax to the profit uh, if anyone sells a second home. Uh, Denisha, she was saying, bring uh, capital wealth more in line with income tax. Uh, so be taxed the same way that you would be on your earnings as opposed to your asset values. What do you think to that idea as well? Um, someone else has just said, Michelle, what we need to do is stop anyone ever being able to have a council house for life. If people had to uh, move out and move into different uh, homes, maybe that would be the solution. Um, what's this one? I've just seen a really good one. And the thing is, you guys are emailing so quickly that as soon as I see one of your um, emails, it goes flying down. Brian is saying, just building houses is not the answer. It has to be all of the infrastructure um, that 
is surrounding it and this is where we go wrong. Many of you are saying, why aren't you mentioning the elephant in the room, Michelle, uh, which is immigration. Keep the population numbers down and that will help the situation. There you go. Uh, it's not an elephant in this room, I tell you. It's a subject we cover frequently. If you've ever watched GB News, I'm sure you will know that. Um, right, what's this one? Kerry, I think that you have a very uh, interesting solution as well. I'm going to save yours to the end because I think you raise a very, very interesting point. Um, someone else has emailed in and said, this is very simple and you're all missing the point. We just need to make home ownership the law, ban landlords, ban renting. Uh, that's all well and good, but you don't tell me how that would work. What would you actually do then? And what would you do with all of the rented properties that currently exist and all the landlords that we currently have? Uh, what would you do? Don't know. You've not told me that bit of your answer. Anyway, that's pretty much all we have got time for. Thank you very much to my panel for your thoughts. Thank you. Your first time on GB <laughs> News. Hope we'll have you again. Uh, and I'll end with Kerry's thoughts. Uh, she says, simple. What we need to do in this country is stop the obsession with home ownership. Do we? Is that where we're all going wrong? Uh, should we forget about that notion that an Englishman's home is his castle? And should we just all get back to renting and in the meantime, gather round our little tables and play Monopoly? You tell me. That's all I've got time for. Have a fantastic weekend and I will see you on Monday. Take care. Good evening. Alex Deacon here with your latest weather update. This weekend won't bring much rain. Many places seeing blue sky and sunny spells. And after a bit of a fresh start, temperatures will be on the increase as we go into next week. All because of this large area of high pressure that's slowly moving in. Notice, however, there is a weather front approaching the northwest and that will bring some rain tomorrow. A few showers around this evening.